Okay. The first speaker of today's program is given by Dr. Joe Bialowski. He is currently a clinical assistant professor at the Department of Physical Therapy, University of Florida. Dr. Bialowski has over 14 years of clinical experience, primarily in orthopedic and musculoskeletal physical therapy. He is a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedics and a, follow, and a fellow in the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapist. He received a bachelor's degree in physical therapy from Ataka College in 1990 and a master's degree in musculoskeletal physical therapy from the University of Pittsburgh in 1998. He graduated from the University of Florida with a PhD in Rehabilitation Sciences in 2008, with his research interests focused on the mechanisms of manual therapy in the treatment of musculoskeletal pain. He is currently supported by the K-12 Rehabilitation Research Career Development Program with a research program focused on the placebo mechanisms of manual therapy and neuroplastic changes in pain associated with musculoskeletal disorders and the response to common rehabilitation intervention. The topic for his talk today is expanding our understanding of manual therapy mechanisms. And in his talk, he's going to explain why understanding of the mechanisms is important and to discuss the complex nature and the therapeutic mechanisms of manual therapy, as well as the focus for moving forward. Please join, you, join me to uh, give you a, uh, a round of applause for Dr. Joe. So the organizers of the, this conference took a calculated risk, and they put the American last with the assumption that I could safely cross the roads in this country um, for, for an entire week. And uh, <laughs> it's driven me crazy. I think I need to go see Brian Mulligan at one of his uh, talks today to have him look at my neck because it's been on a swivel the whole week. So I guess uh, look right or die, I think, was the advice that I was given before coming here. But um, I'm happy to say I'm starting to, to, to figure it out and just in time so I can go back home and probably step off a curb and uh, get hit by somebody coming from the direction I'm used to. But anyways, I am slowly figuring it out. All right, so I, I thought this was going to be a rhetorical question when, uh, when I thought about presenting this after yesterday's debate. I'm not so sure what kind of response I'm going to get. But what I'd like to know before we start is, is how many people here feel strongly that manual therapy is not an effective intervention, that if you get a patient in your clinic, they come in with a musculoskeletal pain complaint, that you're not going to do manual therapy for them because you think it's ineffective. And that was the response I was hoping for. So yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, kind of a, a loaded audience here um, where everybody that comes to a conference like this feels very strongly about these techniques. We all feel that they're effective for our patients. We've seen what they can do for our patients, and, and we feel strongly about them. Our patients tend to feel the same way as well. Many individuals with musculoskeletal pain complaints seek out manual therapy when they do develop pain conditions. And if you practice shared decision making, uh, what you'll find is that many of your patients prefer to have these interventions used as part of their care as well. So if it was that straightforward, that there really wouldn't be a need for me to be here today. Um, I would probably just thank the organizers for having me here. Thank you for coming out early this morning after what was likely a late night. And I encourage you to go off and, and find something that, that was useful for you. Because if they really were that effective as, as interventions, this would really be an academic discussion. So it would be interesting to know, but not something that's particularly clinically relevant. So unfortunately, the literature doesn't support this. What we feel strongly about and, and what our patients often feel strongly about is, is not supported by the literature. So very consistently, systematic reviews and meta-analyses will determine that manual therapy interventions are, are no more effective than comparative interventions, um, or if, if they do find positive findings, they're oftentimes very small magnitude and of questionable clinical importance. So there's really a disconnect between what, what we think and what our patients think and, uh, and what the literature will tell us. And this really leaves us in a, a little bit of a bind because it, it makes no sense to study the mechanisms of ineffective interventions. There's really no reason to try to find out why something that doesn't work um, would work. 
Uh, but what I'm going to argue today is that without an understanding of the mechanisms, we're probably not going to be able to really optimize the, the use of these interventions. So what I'm going to suggest today is, is that we move forward based on the, the clinician experience part of evidence-based practice and the patient preference part of evidence-based practice um, with the assumption that in doing so, and if we can determine a better, get a better understanding of the mechanisms of manual therapy, the research will catch up with us as well. So for this presentation, I'll, I'll break it up into to four parts. Um, the first part of it, I'll talk about why I think understanding the mechanisms of manual therapy is important, and important to research and also as, as clinicians as well. I'll then provide an overview of a mechanistic model which, which we've developed to try to, to organize um, and help design studies and interpretation of studies for the mechanisms of manual therapy. I'll then talk about, and just a couple, there's not time to talk about many, but a few of the key mediators and or moderators of ma the mechanisms of manual therapy that I feel have either overstayed their welcome or I think have a lot of potential moving forward to help us answer some of these questions. And then finally, I'll talk about um, how we can potentially expand the model in some areas that we should really focus on as, as we do move forward. So small effect sizes are not unique to manual therapy when it comes to, to treating pain conditions. And unfortunately, most of our interventions for pain, um, turn, the, the results are the same. That, that it turns out that, that they really don't offer large effect sizes. And really for pain conditions often is that, that no treatment, or treatment is better than no treatment, but no individual treatments really distinguish themselves from each other. And this is most likely, or one of the primary reasons behind this is probably the one-size-fits-all approach that we often take when we're studying these interventions, with the assumption that everybody with a given condition is likely to respond positively to a certain intervention. If this group of people was all diagnosed with cancer and went to see their doctor, we wouldn't expect that the doctor would take out a prescription pad and write the exact same prescription for each of these individuals. What we would expect and what we would hope is that the doctor would try to get a better understanding of the underlying disease process and then would prescribe treatment that was most likely to, to help these, these individuals. Everybody certainly is not going to get a different intervention, but certainly everybody's not going to get the same intervention as well. And we wouldn't expect them all to respond to the same intervention. If we contrast that to the typical study of manual therapy, and oftentimes how manual therapy is practiced clinically too, and in those type of studies and, and some clinical settings, every individual that comes in uh, is given the, the same intervention. In studies, every individual, they, they recruit a large sample of people, and everybody that comes in gets the same intervention. Again, with the assumption that everybody should respond the same. It's not really surprising that our effect sizes then tend to be relatively small in these type of studies because the responders um, probably are, are washed out by the non-responders within this type of a sample. I, we would have much more powerful study findings, most likely, and, and also um, findings in clinical practice as well, if we could take a large group of individuals like this and determine that these were the people that should respond to manual therapy. And then those are the ones that in clinical practice we give manual therapy to. Potentially, these are the ones that we recruit. We tease them out with our inclusion, exclusion criteria for our studies. And they're the ones then that we would expect to benefit. And, and they get the intervention we expect they would benefit from. If we could determine that this group of people would not respond to manual therapy and was potentially likely to benefit from something else in clinical practice, then these are the people we wouldn't give manual therapy for. So it's not this one-size-fits-all approach. Current approaches to identifying responders to manual therapy um, have, have traditionally been related, more related to the clinical prediction rules. And these are really more analogous to throwing everything against a wall and seeing what sticks. Take a, as many variables as you can potentially think of, you statistically analyze all of them, and you try to come up with the, the grouping of them that best identifies individuals who are likely to respond, and in our case, to, to a manual therapy intervention. This was done repeatedly. Um, it was met with great excitement originally, and, and some of these had even been implemented into clinical practice. But Nadine Foster did a, a wonderful job yesterday of, of talking about some of the limitations of this approach. And, and one of the primary limitations is that the derivation study of these is not enough for us to take this and embrace it 
and begin to apply it to, to our patients in clinical practice in order to have um, or feel better about a clinical prediction rule and feel that it can be implemented into practice, it needs to be validated and also needs to be looked at in more than a single arm study. There needs to be a comparison group so we can determine whether the grouping of variables is prognostic, prognostic for the specific intervention, which in our case is manual therapy, or if it's just a general prognostic uh, factor and, and it means that no matter what you do for these people, these are the ones that are likely to, to get better. And unfortunately, at this point, most of the clinical prediction rules for manual therapy either haven't been subjected to validation studies or they've been subjected to validation studies and, and they failed them. They, they have not been replicated. So what I would argue to this point is that this approach to responder, determining responders has been largely a failure and it may be time to think about other approaches that may be uh, be better for us. One approach that may have merit then is mechanistic-based treatment approaches. For a mechanistic-based treatment approach, this requires that you can identify a more homogeneous group of individuals based on the mechanism that contributes to their condition, and then also identify the biological effects of treatment as well. And when you can identify these two factors, then you're able to better match individuals based on the, the factors behind their disorder to what makes the intervention work. What this allows us to do then is to personalize treatment based on the underlying mechanisms with which our patients are presenting. This is complicated in, uh, with, with interventions such as manual therapy because these are complex interventions. With a drug, with a medication, there's a very well-defined uh, active agent within that. There's a very, very well-defined way in which a, a drug seems to work. Manual therapy interventions are complex interventions. The outcomes that we see in response to them are most likely related to a combination of practitioner-related factors, patient-related factors, environmental factors, and then also the interaction between all those factors. Um, so that means there's a lot of, of different factors to account for when we start to try to think about why people get better in response to these interventions. Much more difficult than trying to, to study a drug. And so what that calls for then is a mechanistic model, something to try to guide our, our, our uh, study design and our interpretation of studies as well so that we can account for these varying influences of these complex interventions. This is the model that, that we have designed. Um, the, the model states or postulates that there's a mechanical stress from any manual therapy intervention. And we really feel this model is applicable to any type of manual therapy. When we first started designing the model, we were leaning towards making it a model of uh, spinal manipulation. But the more we thought about it, the more we felt that this was really applicable to, to any type of, of manual therapy approach. And again, the model states that there's a mechanical force that's applied to the tissue. For manual therapy, the mechanical force is most often applied by the hand of the examiner. In response to the mechanical force is a cascade of neurophysiological responses. And these occur within the peripheral nervous system and within the central nervous system at the level of the spinal cord and within the supraspinal structures. And what the model theorizes then is that pain relief in response to manual therapy is a direct result of these neurophysiological responses. In animal studies, we can open the animal up, we can directly visualize the nervous system, and we can see what happens in response to an intervention. With our patients, we obviously don't have the luxury of doing that, and so what the model depends on are these associated responses. So these are behavioral measures which have generally been studied in animals and, and shown to result in specific nervous system responses in animals, and then we can apply them to humans and make the assumption that we're seeing similar type of nervous system responses in humans. So one example would be the, the Hoffman's reflex, which is analogous to the monosynaptic stretch reflex. And this is an indicator of a spinal cord mediated response to manual therapy. If we apply manual, if we measure the Hoffman's reflex at baseline, apply manual therapy to an individual, and then go back and, and remeasure the, the Hoffman's reflex. Again, we can't open the patient up and see what's happening at the spinal cord, but what we can do is look for changes in the Hoffman's reflex as an indirect measure of potential spinal cord mediated effect. So our research is focused primarily on changes in pain modulatory ability in response to uh, spinal manipulation. 
These are two studies that we've done. These both looked at spinal manipulation to the low back. One was done in individuals that were healthy, and one was done in individuals with low back pain. The design of both studies were similar. And what we did for this was first we took baseline measures of pain modulatory ability. We then randomly assigned everybody to either ride a stationary bike for five minutes, to perform a press-up exercise, or to receive a spinal manipulation. And then immediately following the intervention, we went back and we reassessed their, uh, their pain modulatory ability. What we found in both of these studies was a spinal manipulation dependent uh, change and, and positive change in pain modulatory ability. The protocol that we use in animal studies is shown to um, result in increased sensitization at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord or wind up of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And so we take the behavioral measure of ch changes in, um, in this protocol to indicate that, that this is a spinal cord mediated effect of the intervention. So for both of these studies, again, we found changes in pain modulatory um, ability that we attributed then to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord or a spinal cord mediated effect. What we neglected to do in both of these studies was to account for other potential areas. And so that's what we decided to, to look at in, in some subsequent studies. And specifically in two subsequent studies, what we were interested in is what the influence of expectation was on these findings. So what I'll talk about briefly is, is the most recent of these two studies. For this study, we recruited 110 individuals with low back pain and we randomly assigned them to one of four groups. The one group got a spinal manipulation, second group got a placebo spinal manipulation, the third group got a placebo spinal manipulation, but they were told that the manual therapy technique you receive has been shown to significantly reduce low back pain in some people. So they were given the placebo, but also given an instructional set, which we intended to, and which also was effective in increasing their expectation for what they were gonna receive. And then the fourth group received nothing. They were just a natural history group to, to control for the, the natural history. What we saw in this study then were, were similar findings. So we saw that the, the greatest changes in this pain modulatory ability occurred in the spinal manipulation group. And again, what that suggests is that this could potentially be a spinal cord mediated effect of manual therapy. Importantly, what this study also showed was that that finding exceeded the expectation of receiving a, a manual therapy intervention. So that finding seemed to occur above and beyond the expectation um, effect of, of a spinal manipulation. What the model allows for is to consider then both mediators and moderators of manual therapy. And we feel these are very important moving forward in the mechanistic study of manual therapy. So mediators are process variables that implicate potential mechanisms of manual therapy. These should be measured along the continuum of a, a course. So they should be measured at baseline and then along a course of treatment and following treatment as well to establish a temporal precedence with the studied outcome. And what mediators allow us to do is to establish how or why a treatment is effective. So in this example here, the mediator would be um, changes in, in fear. So changes in fear would be observed as well as the, the outcome along the course of the treatment. And if changes of fear in response to one treatment as compared to another correspond to change of outcome, then changes in fear could be, um, could be determined to be a mediator of the outcome of that particular treatment. And again, what this does is really give us treatment targets. It gives us uh, outcome measures that we can assess to, to see if, if our treatments are doing what we think they should to achieve the outcome that, that's desirable to us. Moderators, on the other hand, are selected prior to treatment, and these interact with treatment to influence outcomes. So moderators are helpful for defining for whom and under what condition a treatment is most effective. And again, in the example here, treatment A um, results in worse outcomes in people that have higher fear at baseline and better outcomes in people that have lower fear at baseline. So fear would be a moderator then for this intervention. And what this would allow us to do is stratify care. It allows us to determine that potentially treatment A would be better provided to people with lower levels of fear at baseline and, and something else provided with people with higher levels of fears at baseline. And again, these mediators and moderators are important to our mechanistic understanding of manual therapy and something that the model allows us to account for.
So what I'd like to talk about now are a few of the key mediators and moderators um, that I think are important as, as we move forward, and maybe not so, so important as we move forward. Traditionally, manual therapy has been, been practiced and taught with a very biomechanical emphasis um, and, and with the assumption that the biomechanics of the technique are the driving force behind the outcomes that we see. So all of us have learned um, all kinds of assessment techniques for, for various joints to, to look for dysfunction in the joints, looking for hypomobile joints or malaligned joints. And then we've also learned all kinds of treatment approaches as well to try to correct what we find. If we find a joint that's limited in one direction, we need to do this. If we find a joint that's limited in another direction, we need to do that. The literature more recently has called this approach into question. Um, so, so as we study it more, we find that our assessment techniques are not nearly as reliable as we'd like them to be. Um, our techniques are not as specific as we like them to be. When we apply a technique, the force tends to be directed over a much larger area than we care to admit sometimes. Uh, and, and movement occurs in response to these techniques, but there doesn't seem to be positional changes following the technique either. Perhaps most damning to this approach are, are some of the literature that suggests that, that the technique itself really doesn't matter. The specific mechanical parameters of the technique may not really influence outcomes. And this has been shown in studies that have found that if, if a technique is applied to the area of, of pain or applied remotely to the area of pain, outcomes seem to be the same. Studies have also found that very similar outcomes with, with differing techniques. And then finally, studies have also found that the outcomes really don't seem to matter if a clinician looks at, at the participants in the study and carefully assesses them and then makes a determination on what type of manual therapy intervention to apply, or if a researcher just arbitrarily chooses a technique and, and decides without any knowledge of the participant and decides that that's what, what everybody's going to use. Um, so, so in my mind, what these studies really suggest is this specific approach to manual therapy may not be necessary. The, the literature would suggest that the outcomes aren't dependent upon this. So the model does account for the mechanical stimulus as a mechanism of manual therapy, and, and I do believe that should be continued to, to be studied. Um, studies of the mechanism have found differing neurophysiological responses by different mechanical parameters, and usually those favor higher velocity and higher force type of manual therapy in, interventions. There tends to be greater neurophysiological responses with techniques that are higher velocity and also higher force. Um, so there may be, it may be that some patient presentations are more likely to, to benefit from differing neurophysiological effects based on mechanical parameters of the interventions, and this should be continued to be studied. But again, what I would suggest is this continued search for these um, malaligned or hypermobile and, and very specific faults is probably not a, a, a relevant mechanism to why manual therapy works and probably not something that we need to continue to, to consider. What I will talk about now are two things that I think really do have a lot of potential to advance our understanding of the mechanisms of manual therapy. The first is pain modulatory profiles. So quantitative sensory testing is an established method for assessing pain sensitivity and also pain processing. With quantitative sensory testing, a standardized noxious stimulus is applied and then pain ratings are obtained in response to this. And there's really two categories of quantitative sensory testing that, that I'll focus on today. And those are static measures of quantitative sensory testing and also dynamic measures of quantitative sensory testing. Static measures really tell you the most about pain sensitivity. Um, so these can be assessed at the area of pain to suggest uh, peripheral sensitization. They can also be uh, assessed at areas remote from the pain. And if they, they are, if individuals are more sensitive at remote areas, that may suggest more of a central type of problem. The two static measures that are most commonly used are pain threshold and pain tolerance. So pain threshold would be if I pushed on your neck with an algometer and I slowly pushed, and when I got to three kilograms of force, you told me that the experience or the sensation had changed from being pressure to pain, that would be your pain threshold, would be three kilograms. 
if I continued to push on your neck with that algometer, and at seven kilograms you told me to stop and you said you couldn't take the pain anymore, then your pain tolerance would be considered to be seven kilograms. And again, those are static measures, most indicative of pain sensitivity. The dynamic measures are more indicative of a pain modulatory ability of the individual. And the two that I'll talk about, the two most common ones, are temporal summation and also conditioned pain modulation. Temporal summation is an increase in pain sensitivity in response to an unchanging stimulus. Animal studies uh, show that this results in wind up at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So when you open an animal up and do these protocols with them, what you see is increased firing of the dorsal horn neurons, suggesting increased excitability of the dorsal horn neurons. So temporal summation then serves as a behavioral measure of this wind up in, in humans. This is an example of the temporal summation protocol here that we use. The blue bars are heat, uh, heat um, pulses. Each one is at 49 degrees Celsius, which is above the threshold for most individuals. And that's shown, temperature shown on the y-axis on the left here. The red bar indicates an individual pain response. This is on a zero to 100 numeric pain rating scale, with zero being no pain and 100 being the worst pain imaginable. And that's indicated by the y-axis on the, the right side here. The pulses are given, each one is given within a second of the one that precedes it. And what you can see is in response to that, the individual's rating their pain at 40 out of 100 for the first two pulses. By the 10th pulse, they're rating the pain as 90 out of 100. So even though this stimulus is not changed at all, even though the stimulus continues to be 49 degrees Celsius, the individual is perceiving it as, as more, um, more painful for them. So again, this is an indication of pain facilitatory process uh, and, and is, is thought to be indicative of wind up at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Conditioned pain modulation is reflective of a pain inhibitory process, and this is thought to work through the spinal ball or spinal loop. Um, this really goes off the premise that pain inhibits pain. And so in this example, if we were to do the temporal summation on the right arm of, of this individual here at baseline, get pain ratings for that, and then we placed her arm in a cold water bath that caused pain over in this arm. If we went back and reassessed temporal summation again over here with well-functioning condition pain modulation, what we would see is a decrease in her self-report of pain over there. So it's the idea that pain in one area is going to inhibit pain in, in another area. So we can use this information and these pain modulatory profiles to try to categorize individuals. And so individuals that have either heightened temporal summation or they have a, a lack or inadequate functioning uh, condition pain modulation may be thought of as, as pronociceptive. And these individuals are thought to potentially be more likely to develop a pain condition, uh, more likely to have higher intensity of pain when they do develop a pain condition, and also more likely to not recover from a pain condition. Individuals with lower levels of temporal summation or better functioning condition pain, modul modul yeah, pain, condition pain modulation um, are considered antinociceptive, and these individuals are thought to be less likely to develop a pain condition, likely to have lower levels of pain when they do develop a pain condition, and also more likely to recover from a pain condition as well. Many of our chronic pain uh, patients that come to see us have this maladaptive neuroplastic changes in response to pain as indicated by either heightened levels of temporal summation or poorly functioning condition pain um, modulation profiles. And such an approach may inform a mechanistic-based approach to, to treatment. So this has been looked at with drug studies. Duloxetin is a, a medication which enhances descending inhibition of pain, and this is found to be more, uh, more um, effective in individuals with poor functioning condition pain modulation. Ketamine inhibits temporal summation, and this has been found to be more effective for people with higher levels of temporal summation. So we may be able to, to um, use a mechanistic-based approach to treatment based on these pain modulatory profiles. And again, this has been studied in, in medication. It has not been looked at extensively in uh, manual therapy. So what I'd like you to do is consider two patients that you may see in the clinic. The first patient comes to you with a complaint of shoulder pain. When you assess this person, uh, the pain will say has been present for approximately three months. 
Uh, we'll say that they have pain to palpate the, maybe the rotator cuff and the long head of the biceps. They may have some weakness in the rotator cuff. They may have some limitations in internal rotation. And if you assess the joint mobility, they have some posterior capsule tightness um, and maybe some, some scapular dyskinesia as, as well. So if we think about treating this patient from a manual therapy perspective, I think this is a patient we would all be relatively comfortable treating. I think we would all feel comfortable that this is a person that would be likely to respond to our interventions. We all have different approaches manual therapy wise to how we might treat this person, but I, I think it's safe to assume that we might do some type of soft tissue work to the rotator cuff or long head of the biceps. We might do some type of joint biased approach to the, the posterior capsule. And you would expect this person to, to respond positively and expect a good outcome with this person. What if later in the day, though, this person came in to see you? And, and again, with the same diagnosis of, of shoulder pain. But as you sit down and you start talking to this individual, what she tells you is that she has a 20-year history of fibromyalgia. She's had multiple musculoskeletal complaints in the past for which she's gone and, and sought health care for and seen multiple physical therapists for, for many other problems. She has a history of depression, she's fatigued, she doesn't sleep well. And when you go to, to do your um, clinical examination of her, she really doesn't fit a pattern that you recognize. She's really painful with, with all movements. Some you would expect to be painful, some you wouldn't expect. Generalized hypersensitivity when, when you palpate her. The special tests really aren't very informed. So she really doesn't fit a, a picture or a pattern that, that you would expect with this patient. And the question then is, is from a manual therapy perspective, what do you do? Is, is this a person that, uh, that we think can, can benefit from manual therapy or that we, we should be applying manual therapy to? These two patients really fall at, at two ends of the spectrum then. So the patient A is, is a patient that presents with seemingly no susceptive pain, uh, a, a peripherally driven pain so source. Um, and, and again, somebody that we expect is going to benefit from our peripherally directed interventions. Patient B, on the other hand, presents with a centralized pain condition. Uh, so certainly centralized pain conditions are driven by a peripheral nociceptive force, but that is augmented in, in them. So there, there's really something's going on once the, the impulse reaches her nervous system, things are changing in there. Much more difficult to treat, and particularly from a manual therapy perspective. Daniel Claw uh, describes this, this type of patient, um, as, as having the volume turned up or also as, as having too much gain, uh, the analogous to too much gain on, on an amplifier. And, and with the implication of that being that these individuals with centralized pain conditions, they get the same input as, as others, but once it reaches the nervous system, it gets amplified. So similar to how this poor guy at a Justin Bieber concert may look, same input is going in, but they just don't handle it very well. They can't tolerate it very well. It can make them much more difficult to treat. Frederick Wolf describes this then as, or what he talks about is that we, we tend to kind of categorize that someone has either a peripheral problem or a central problem, and fibromyalgia is kind of the extreme central problem. What Frederick Wolf argues for is fibromyalgia not necessarily being a distinct clinical entity, but really being more of a continuum. And this is a study they did where they looked at over 20,000 people with rheumatoid arthritis and where they fell along a diagnostic scale for fibromyalgia. And what they found with this, now if, if you look at the, the midline here, this is the mean for the group of individuals with rheumatoid arthritis. This is the mean for, for a normal group of individuals with fibromyalgia. So certainly fibromyalgia is at the far end of the continuum. But again, what you can see is that within these patients, they all fall along this continuum here. So for our purposes, our patient A would probably fall here. Patient B is probably going to fall out here. But what we have to realize and what's becoming readily apparent that is a lot of our patients with chronic pain conditions, such as low back pain, such as osteoarthritis, such as temporomandibular joint disorder, that we tend to think of as falling here with more of a peripheral type of problem, really fall along this continuum. And many of them fall much more closer to this central pain type of condition than we've given credit for in the past. So how does this relate to, to manual therapy then? Well, we know that manual therapy is effective for, for um, influencing pain. 
systematic reviews have looked at this and very consistently found that manual therapy is not only effective in lowering pain sensitivity at the site of application, but it also can be effective for lowering pain at distal sites. And what that suggests is a central um, mediating effect or a central desensitizing effect of manual therapy on the nervous system. Manual therapy seems to be able to desensitize an individual's nervous system. What hasn't been studied and what we've really neglected to study in as much detail are these dynamic measures. So the uh, systematic reviews, the meta-analyses that I just showed all focused primarily on the static measures of pain sensitivity and, and primarily pain threshold. And that's because that's what's out there in the literature. That's what's primarily been looked at. Looked at in much less detail have been these dynamic uh, measures. And this is an important consideration because these dynamic measures seem to be more related to clinical outcomes. These seem to have, be more reflective of, of clinical pain, clinical outcomes than do the static measures. Preliminary studies to this point suggest that manual therapy is uh, effective in changing and altering the pain modulatory profile and, and making it a, a more effective pain modulatory profile. We've looked at this in several studies with temporal summation and found that temporal summation is inhibited by manual therapy interventions. Carol Courtney's groups recently looked at conditioned pain modulation in individuals with knee pain and found that you could enhance condition, or with knee osteoarthritis, and found you could enhance conditioned pain modulation through the use of joint mobilization to these individuals as well. So what this suggests is that manual therapy may have a, an important mechanism related to our ability to desensitize the individuals through altering the, the pain modulatory profiles. Typical patient that, that comes in uh, with a peripheral or a nociceptive type of pain condition, we expect that if we do peripherally directed interventions, such as injections, that those are going to be well retolerated re and, and the person's going to get better um, from that. In individuals with central pain conditions, Peripheral nociceptive input, if you can knock that peripheral nociceptive input out, the central presentation tends to, to do much better as well. It tends to resolve as well, but it can be much harder to knock that out. They don't tolerate some of the standard approaches as well, such as, as exercise, and what does go in tends to, tends to be augmented by it. So what's theorized then is, is that potentially interventions such as manual therapy may be an important adjunct to the treatment of these individuals because they can be used to desensitize the nervous system. They may be helpful to desensitize the nervous system and allow these peripheral interventions to then work in a more efficient manner. And, and so again, for our patient B, manual therapy is essentially the earplugs that allow this person to, to function at the Justin Bieber concert a little bit better. All right, so the next thing I'd like to talk about then, or the next aspect I'd like to talk about, are what I consider to be a common mechanistic pathway for all interventions for pain, and particularly for manual therapy, and, and that's placebo mechanisms of manual therapy. So I think if, if at the beginning of the week or when you were thinking about coming here, if, if there had been a, a big study that had come out and, and shown that manual therapy was nothing but a placebo effect, I think a lot of you would have either canceled your trip to, uh, to Scotland or decided to come anyways, because Glasgow is a, a beautiful city, but, uh, but not necessarily spent time at, at a conference to learn about these interventions. And that's because placebo is usually thought of negatively. It's, it's usually at best thought of as, as nothing, and at worst thought of as deceitful use of nothing. And so what I'm going to argue for, and, and what's been argued for already this week, is that placebo is, is really not nothing, and a placebo mechanism is, is part of the mechanisms of manual therapy is, is really not a bad thing. So placebo is associated with a very robust analgesic effect. Studies that have looked at uh, comparing um, systematic reviews of studies that have compared a placebo group to a no treatment group find that the placebo group tends to improve two points on a, an 11 point numeric pain rating scale in comparison to the, the no treatment group. And this is not an inconsequential finding. Drug companies spend millions of dollars a year to test their products, and they would be thrilled with this type of response to their medication. 
Uh, if they cherry pick from these studies and they look at and assess just the individuals who, uh, who responded to placebo, what they find is between a three and a five point improvement uh, in comparison to the no treatment control group. So placebo is associated with a very robust analgesic response. Placebo is also associated with the physiological response as well. So very specific activation of the brain and the spinal cord occurs in response to placebo analgesia. Placebo analgesia is dependent upon the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. So an individual with Alzheimer's disease where there's damage to the prefrontal cortex, they don't experience placebo responses. Um, if you experimentally block the prefrontal cortex, you can also abolish the placebo response. And it's also dependent upon the cannabinoid and the opioid pathways as well. So if you provide drugs to block these pathways, the placebo response will be as abolished as well. So again, what this literature suggests is that placebo is not nothing. Placebo is associated with a very robust analgesic response, and it's also associated with very consistent physiological responses as well. Expectation is a primary mechanism of placebo, and, and this is a, what I think is a great study that demonstrates the influence of expectation, and the beauty of this study is it does it without using a placebo. So what they did in this study, this was a study of healthy individuals, and they, they induced pain in them. Quantitative sensory testing oftentimes uses a very specific uh, stimulus, so everybody gets the same stimulus, and you look to see how the pain ratings differ. In this study, what they did was to give everybody a different stimulus, but they gave them enough of a heat stimulus so that everybody had approximately a 70 out of 100 pain rating at baseline. So they altered the stimulus in order to get everybody with the same pain rating to start with. This is their baseline measures here. Then what they did was they hooked them up to an IV infusion of a, a powerful opioid agent, and they started the infusion. At this point here, though, they didn't tell them, though. So what they told them, they hooked them up, they started the infusion, but they told them here that they were receiving saline. They said, we're gonna run saline through the infusion first before we start the medication. So at this line right here, individuals were receiving the medication, but they didn't know they were receiving the medication. They thought they were just receiving um, saline. And what you can see is there was an analgesic response, but it was very small. They then kept the infusion going. At this point here, they told people that they were getting the infusion. So now at this point here, people are getting the medication and they know they're getting the medication. You can see there's a much larger uh, effect of, of that at, at that point. And then for the final part of it, they kept the medication going, but they told people that we're gonna stop the medication now, we're gonna start putting the saline back in again, and most people experience an increase in pain when we do that. And what you can see is that basically abolished. This is a powerful opioid mechanism, or a powerful opioid me medication. This is a known analgesic agent, and the effect was essentially um, abolished when individuals were told that it wasn't being given and that it would, uh, it, they should expect to have an increase of pain. So what's really fascinating about this study is that the medication was exactly the same at each of these time points. The dosage was exactly the same at each of these time points but the analgesic response was vastly different based on what the person's expectations were um, as a result of the instructional set. So our model then accounts for placebo mechanisms, um, and, and primarily what we consider placebo is, is a supraspinally mediated mechanism of manual therapy related to expectation for the manual therapy. There's a number of problems with the placebo mechanism literature in manual therapy. One of the biggest problems is what do we use for a placebo? Um, in drug studies, it's relatively easy because we know what the active ingredient is, and so you can get a pill that's the same size, shape, and color as a studied medication, put starch or sugar in it, and give it to the individual in the same context as the medication, and that's your placebo. This isn't foolproof because there are side effects with the medications and sometimes that influences blinding, but it's a much simpler way to do it. With manual therapy, we have absolutely no idea what the active ingredient is, so it makes it very difficult to come up with a, uh, a valid placebo for manual therapy interventions. Some of the attempts that have been made have included detuned modalities such as detuned ultrasound, detuned laser, light touch has been used as a, um, a supposed placebo control, and then there have been a, a number of attempts to do sham manual therapy interventions that usually differ based on the biomechanical parameters of the, the techniques. 
Number of issues with this. Uh, one is that in placebo controlled studies, people know they have a 50% chance of receiving a placebo. As part of the consent process, they're told they're going to get a studied intervention or a placebo. And so blinding is very important then. And what we don't know is, is if in a manual therapy study using a detuned ultrasound as a placebo, if individuals in the, the ultrasound group are unblinded, if, if more people in the ultrasound group think this doesn't seem like a real intervention, I think I'm getting the placebo, while the people in the, in the manual therapy study think they're getting an, an, actually, um, an actual intervention. The other issue with that is expectation for the interventions as well. Um, so it may be someone's receiving a detuned ultrasound and thinks they're getting an actual intervention, but has much lower expectations for its ability to help them than the individuals that are receiving the manual therapy intervention. So both of those can alter the effects of, or the outcomes of our study, and they're not usually controlled for very well in our, our placebo-controlled studies. Second issue with the placebo literature and placebo mechanism manual therapy is the issue of placebo control study versus a placebo mechanism study. Placebo control studies, individuals, again, know they have a 50% chance of, of getting a, a placebo. And in that type of study design, there tends to be a placebo response, but it tends to be relatively small. Placebo mechanism studies, individuals are given a placebo, but they're told the intervention you're receiving has been shown to be very effective. So they're given an instructional set to try to enhance expectation for, the, um, for, for what they're being given. In those studies, placebo response is much stronger. This is an example of that. This was really two studies that were done. The first study was an attempt to validate a placebo for irritable bowel syndrome. And so what they did, if, if you can believe this, is that they took a, a balloon and they inserted it into the rectum of these poor individuals, and they did it under three um, different conditions. First condition was a natural history condition, so the balloon was, was put in, there was nothing on it, and they got pain ratings. Second condition was a placebo condition, so there was saline that was on the balloon. And the third condition was with lidocaine, so that was the, the active, um, active agent condition of it. This was a placebo control study, so again, people knew they had a 50% chance of getting a placebo. And what you can see, pain ratings are on the y-axis on the left here. The group that got nothing, the natural history group, had the most pain in response to the task. The placebo group, there was a placebo response, but it was relatively small. And then the lidocaine group did the best. They had the greatest, greatest analgesic effect. What these authors decided to do then was go back and redo this study, but as a placebo mechanism study. So they did it exactly the same way, but this time the group that got the placebo was told the intervention that you're receiving has been shown to be very effective for some individuals with your condition. This wasn't a lie because they had found that it was effective for some individuals, so ethically this was acceptable. What they found in this study design, though, was again, people that had not the natural history group had the most um, pain. Now the placebo group actually outperformed the lidocaine group. That wasn't statistically significant, um, so, but at the very least what we can say is that placebo was as good as lidocaine when done in, in this type of design. That doesn't mean lidocaine is ineffective. Lidocaine is a known analgesic agent. It's known to act through a peripheral mechanism. But what it does suggest is, is that a centrally acting agent related to placebo can be just as effective as lidocaine when it's provided under this type of context. Third issue with placebo is we don't know the placebo effect size um, as far as it, within our, our studies and our mechanisms of manual therapy. Typical manual therapy placebo control study has two groups, and what you may see is that the manual therapy has this big of an outcome associated with it, and the placebo has this big of an outcome. So we can say manual therapy is that much better than placebo. Very tempting then to say that this is the placebo effect, but it's not. Um, that is the placebo response, because what that doesn't allow us to account for are factors such as natural history, such as regression to the mean, um, other things that may account for the outcome that we're seeing here. In order to determine the placebo effect size, we need a study that has a third group, which is a natural history group. And so what we can say with this type of study design is that the natural history group had that big of an outcome, because we expect people are gonna get better over time no matter what we do for them. We can say our outcome was that big. We can say then placebo is that much bigger, that this much of our placebo response is due to natural history, regression of the mean, the Hawthorne effect, some other factor. And then this is our placebo effect size right there. 
we can take this a step further and superimpose this on our, our other intervention, and we can say that this much of our intervention effect can be accounted for by natural history, this much can be accounted for by placebo, and then this much can be accounted for by some other mechanism that's specific to the, um, to the intervention. And then finally, what we don't know about placebo is, is there an additive effect? We know if we give somebody a placebo and if we tell them that it's, it's very effective, if we're very nice to them while we give it to them, if we interact with them, if we ex give, express empathy while we give them a placebo, we know that enhances placebo effect size. So if we give someone a placebo and we do those things, we may see that much of an improvement in our, our placebo effect size. We've talked an awful lot this week about how important it is that we communicate well with our patients, that we, we interact with them, we're empathetic to them, with the assumption that by doing so, we'll alter the, the, um, the, the magnitude of the outcomes that we see in response to our interventions. But we really don't know that. We haven't systematically studied that. And so what we don't know are if these nonspecific effects, which we know can enhance the effect of a placebo, have an additive effect on, on our, um, our other interventions as well, our manual therapy interventions. And again, we make this assumption, but this has not been systematically studied. All right, so then finally what I'd like to do is just talk about a few things moving forward for improving the model and improving the, the studies and the mechanisms of manual therapy. One of the big issues with manual therapy is, is we've been stopping way too soon with, with most of our studies, and I'm certainly as guilty of this as anybody else. We have all kinds of immediate effects studies right now for manual therapy. Um, those are very helpful to start to give us um, considerations for neurophysiological responses to it. But I think we have enough of those at this point. And then what we really need to do now with our studies moving forward is to start to try to find out which of those immediate changes um, are important and, and how they uh, correspond to, to clinical outcomes that we're really interested in. So rather than these continued immediate effect uh, one-time studies, what we need to start doing is starting to try to coordinate these with our, our clinical outcomes, following these changes over time to see if, if they are reflective of clinical outcomes. We also need to do a better job of designing studies to account for mediators and moderators as potential mechanisms of manual therapy. This is not an, an easy endeavor. It's going to necessitate a much larger sample size to account for the main effects of treatment, or a much larger sample size than what is needed um, to, to account for the main effects of treatment. Because with these, we're going to need to be able to account for many different interactions and sometimes multiple direction interactions as, as well. So this will require a lot larger sample. What it may require is coordination of, of multi-center studies as, as well, so we can get these number of people. We'll need strong theoretical basis for this as, as well. Rather than kind of throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks, we need to do a better job of having sound theories behind what we look at as potential mediators and moderators of, of the influences of manual therapy. And this is where some of the, the prior immediate effects studies may be helpful to start to guide us for, for what we consider with this. And the moderators may influence the mediator outcome relationship. And what this means is that the statistical analysis for these type of studies is going to be much more difficult than what we tr traditionally have when we're just looking for main effects or, or for very basic interactions. So this will require uh, uh, some, some more detailed statistical analysis as well. Provider attributes are not included in the model at this point, and, and more recent studies suggest that, that maybe they should be. Chad Cook's group came out with a study where they looked at uh, thrust manipulation versus non-thrust manipulation for individuals with low back pain, and what they found was it didn't matter. Outcomes were the same regardless of which intervention was applied. But what they also found, though, was an association between the provider's preferences for which type of intervention they applied and the outcomes that were observed. Expectation of the practitioner also seems to have an effect on outcomes as well. Um, so, so the expectations that you have for the interventions that you're providing and for the patient, how the patient's going to do, also may influence outcomes. And again, the current model does not account for this, and this is probably something that when we think about mediators and moderators, we may need to start accounting for. <clears throat> 
We also need to think about expanding the clinical outcomes. When the model was originally designed, it was designed to, uh, to account for pain as an outcome. So it was designed as a mechanistic model for changes in pain. Uh, there's other outcomes that are gonna be important to our patients as well. So things like changes in emotional distress, changes in interference with daily activity, and also satisfaction with the, care pre uh, with the care may also be important outcomes to our patients. And manual therapy may differentially affect these different outcomes. Um, so these are important considerations as we move forward that maybe we're not measuring the, the right thing and we may need to, to focus on some of these other outcomes as well and try to figure out how manual therapy is effective for influencing other things than just pain. All right, so then final thoughts on this. Um, in, in my mind, understanding the mechanisms of manual therapy is, is essential to progressing practice. Um, we, we've done enough systematic reviews, and, and I, I think at this point, we really don't need any more systematic reviews. I think if we continue to do systematic reviews of studies with the same old methodology, I can pretty much tell you what we're gonna find for as, as far out as, as you wanna go. Until we do a better job of starting to identify and, and providing these interventions for people that are likely to, uh, to, to benefit from them, we're very unlikely to find any type of, of effect size. Certainly, mechanistic approaches to, to stratifying care are, is just one option for it, but I think this is an option that's been underutilized and, and has a lot of potential. Mechanistic-based treatment may be more efficient uh, way means to identify responders to manual therapy and, and certainly may be a more educated approach to it than, uh, than, than some of the, the current clinical prediction rule approaches. And then expanding our understanding of the mechanisms of manual therapy will require consider actions of the, consideration of the interactions between the mediators and the moderators, and then also longitudinal studies so we can start to, to look and see how these neurophysiological responses relate to our, our clinical outcomes. That acknowledge, and thank you for your time. And thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you very much for giving us a very precise account on the possible mechanisms of manual therapy. I also have some questions here from the ground. Um, the first one is, um, how realistic is the subgroup hypothesis, given that highly individual nature of the pain experience? Because the subgroup is only defined by the variable that we choose to measure, but what about the variables that we don't measure and the potential influences. And so, sorry, hard, hard to hear here, but I, so if, if I'm paraphrasing the question correctly, I think the question was basically related to the high variability in the pain experience and, and how can we possibly account for, for all the potential factors? Is that? Uh, how realistic is that you can identify subgroup, how homogenous they are? Yeah. And, and I, I agree to a point, um, I, I think, and that's one of the issues when we talk about placebo, everybody would love to, to be able to identify placebo responders and, and researchers would love it because if you could identify a placebo responder, you wouldn't recruit them in your study. You, you would keep the placebo responders out of your study and then your, your effect sizes would be great for your interventions because uh, nobody would respond to the, the placebo. If we could identify placebo responders in clinical care, it would be nice too. They've, done a number of analyses to try to identify placebo responders and, and they've all failed miserably. And so what the consensus is now is, is that basically everybody's a placebo responder, but the type of placebo that you're gonna respond to is, is gonna be very individualized, something that, that I'm conditioned to, to respond to or um, would respond to because my expectation will be very different from, from others. I agree subgrouping is, is not a, a, an easy endeavor, but, but I also think that we can do a better job than we, we do right now. This one size fits all approach, um, you know, I think there's, a, th th there's an intermediate approach that we can take. We can start to account for some of the, um, the variability that we see in clinical outcomes, and we can use that to, uh, to, to try to drive our treatments based on how we know that they work. All right, okay. The second question is, if manual therapy have central effects, why select only peripheral sensitization patient for manual therapy and not use it on persons with widespread pain? 
and, and so the question was, if you, why, if it's central effects, and, and that's really what my argument is, is, is not that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be considered for people with only peripheral um, or with no susceptive type of pain, that potentially this may be something in combination with, with other approaches may be helpful as a means to desensitize people with, with central pain presentations. So I'm certainly not advocating that, uh, that, that we only use these on people with no susceptive or, or peripheral type of pain, uh, but instead, based on what we know about the ability of manual therapy to desensitize the nervous system, using it on people with these central pain presentations may be a consideration. And, and again, we tend to think of central pain conditions as the two extremes. We tend to think of a central pain condition as fibromyalgia. Um, the, the extreme end of the spectrum, and, and there may be some good arguments that, that that person's beyond what manual therapy is going to be helpful for, but we see a lot of people in the continuum that are leaning towards those central pain conditions that, that are less involved than kind of your end of the spectrum fibromyalgia patient, where these approaches may be very helpful to desensitize the central nervous system and allow then the, the peripheral nociceptive uh, source to, to have a better chance of being knocked out by, by other interventions. All right. Okay. Thank you. I think time's up. Okay. Thank you very much for Dr. Barlowski for giving us Thank the talk. Thank you for coming out. Thank, Thank you for you. your time.